Hey buddies, Potato McWhiskey here and these are my 7 unknown tips that people won't tell you about in Civilization 6. The first one is right up here. This is not an obvious thing. I get asked about this all the time. It is this ribbon at the top right hand corner of the screen uh, that contains all of this leader information. I literally get a comment about this multiple times a day. I'm talking every single video I post, there is someone asking me, how do I get this? What mod do I use? Is it cheating? Uh, I actually had someone accuse me of cheating for having this, which is just wild because all you have to do is go up here to the game menu, open the game menu, go down to options, then come down here to the interface options, go to show yields in HUD ribbon and set this to always show. If I turn it off, you can see the ribbon has disappeared. And so we just quickly go back in and reactivate that. And now you too can have the ability to cheat, I guess, and see all of this valuable information about the enemy players. This is actually really, really helpful. In particular, in this uh, Egypt game that I played, I was able to correctly identify that Pericles was going to be a huge problem in terms of his cultural output. And so I declared war on him and took all of his cities. But that's a story for another video. There's another really, it, it can be kind of minor, but I found it to be pretty major when I disabled it back pretty much on launch when you had to disable it by going into the configuration files of the game. And it is the auto unit cycler. Auto unit cycling, okay? Set this to disabled. Uh, basically what this does is it deactivates. Sometimes what happens is uh, when you use a unit in Civilization 6, the game will automatically pan your camera to the next unit that you want to use. Um, but I found that really, really annoying. And so I turned this off. And if you turn this off, it's going to be, uh, it's going to get rid of that little bit of a frustration for you. If you also found that to be frustrating. It could be a bit of a minor thing. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, the vast majority of people who play Civ, like with any regularity, really don't like this. And so I always recommend turning it off. This is another one of those, these kind of minor options things. I really, really, really recommend if you have trouble with the day night cycle of Civilization 6, it's a really, really cool feature. But I find when it's nighttime, if I set it to nighttime right now, I, I just find the game is a little bit harder to play and readable, especially when the time of day is like changing dynamically throughout, you know, the game. So I just find it's way easier if you just disable the animated time of day and set the time to somewhere, say, between 9 a.m. and like 2, 3 p.m. And you'll get a nice, bright, consistent lighting that'll just make the game kind of pop and easier to read, I find. This is actually a bit of a performance tip as well. If you come up here and go to your options and game options, there's going to be these two things called quick combat and quick movement. Uh, for most players, I believe this starts disabled and this is important. You want to enable quick combat and enable quick movement because this can easily shave off 60% of the time it takes for a turn to process. Because oftentimes when you're sitting at the end turn screen waiting for the, turn, the next turn to come up, a lot of the time you're actually just waiting around for unit animation to complete and they can take upwards of 60 to 70 percent of the time it takes for a turn to process if you enable these you shave that off so if you were taking a minute to finish a turn it could easily be 15 to 20 seconds now some people don't like that they don't have the animations anymore so at the very least i would always recommend enabling quick movement and you can leave quick combat on if you like being able to see where exactly attacks happened and stuff like that the next tip is a hotkey tip come down here to your key bindings options and make sure you bind the next action key to something you can easily click on where your hand rests. I have it set to Z and Shift Z because sometimes I'm holding down the Shift key and I still want to go to my next action. And basically what this hotkey does is it clicks on this area of the screen right here, this Choose Production. You can see here, if I click on this with my mouse, it takes me to Apu. So if I close out of Apu, I'm just going to scroll away and then hit my Z key. It'll also bring me to Apu. But the really nice thing about this is I don't have to bring my mouse down here and click. I can just be kind of like doing an action, finish the action, then quickly tap it and be over here and then making decisions. So I build a bank and then without ever leaving this screen, I can tap Z again and it'll take me to the next one. So I don't even have to close out of it. So even when I can't see this button behind, I can still tap the key and it'll take me to the next action. This is a really, really, really nice hotkey that'll speed up how long it takes you to play your games and just kind of streamline how you play the game. This is a 
bit more of a gameplay tip, uh, but it's one that I see a lot of people make the mistake of. And I, I often, I'm kind of lazy sometimes when I'm playing the game, so I don't really take advantage of this. But if you really want to optimize your city management, you're going to have to start paying attention to housing. So if I click on Tofu, for example, you can see this city is 12 out of 12 in terms of housing. If I go to the toggle city details screen here, you can see there's a line here called housing multiplier. And what this does is it's basically taking the number from down here. You can see house population growth rate slowed by 75%. What that means is uh, any food that we have surplus is being multiplied by 0.25. So you can see here 7.1 food gets multiplied by 0.25 and becomes 1.7 food surplus. That means we're working about you know 7.1 too much food because every point of food we work above our maintenance level is only a quarter as valuable as it usually is which means if we have the option to work less food and more production for example right now i'm working this uh, food tile right here but i could very easily uh, switch this to a different tile so for example, one way you can deal with this is by manually locking in high production tiles so that your city doesn't work these high food tiles. The other way to do it is to unlock everything. Go ahead and click on the food management button here. Tell it to focus on food and then click it again to tell it to avoid food. Then you look here and you can see I've got a negative three food problem. And by just simply locking in this wheat tile, I should be able to prevent this city from starving. Okay, why are you... Why are you there? That makes no sense. Okay, sometimes the city manager does kind of weird things, like why is it working both of these things? That doesn't make sense. But if I lock in these tiles, for example, you can see here, I'm now wasting less food, right? I'm working more meaningful tiles. Uh, and you want to get your... When you have a big penalty like this, you want to minimize how much surplus food you're working in favor of other yields. Because essentially, every piece of food that I'm working above 24 food is worth one quarter. That means if I want, you know, two surplus food, I have to work eight surplus food, which means it's just way more valuable when you're at your housing cap to switch around. Now, it is also important to note that you don't always get this little housing alert so you are going to have to kind of check this manually when you're massively above your population you will still get the 25 percent penalty but when you're uberly above it like in my capital over here that has 19 out of 13 population you can see our housing multiplier is actually zero which means that every single piece of food that we work over 38 food is completely worthless okay um our time, our worker time, would be far better spent working literally anything else. Which means I should come in here and unwork all of these food tiles and instead choose to work either my commercial hub or my holy side or my theater square and just kind of work less food, right? Now, you don't want to unwork your productive tiles. Always keep those going because they're really valuable. But this is just another little tip that a lot of people miss. Um, and the food penalty, I believe, if I come up here to Caesar Salad Town, it doesn't apply when you're below your housing limit, unless you're exactly one below. You can see here, every piece of surplus, fo surplus food in Caesar Salad Town, I apologize for the city name, <laughs> um, every piece of surplus, surplus food here would be, would be acquired, because if I come in here and I kind of just like work a little bit of extra food here you can see we have plus 10 food we're eating eight of it and we're getting the full 2.1 but if i come over to let me see if i can find a city that is yeah here we go we've got buto buto is only one population away from its housing limit but it still gets a 50 percent penalty to its surplus food which means if we have the option in here we're going to want to look around and see if we can uh, work something other than food like if we're working a tile that exclusively has food we might want to switch away from it and just minimize how much food we're working at least until we get a little bit more housing in here so the important the key points are when you're close to your housing limit surplus food gets halved in value so you're going to want to start looking for things to work other than food when you are above your uh, housing limit or equal to it, you will start to take a 75% penalty, meaning you should work even harder to avoid working food. And when you're massively above it, any surplus food is completely just wasted. The other final little quick tip I want to give is people often don't use spies correctly. And here, here's a very simple strategy to getting value out of your spies. 
build them as soon as you can possibly do so in a high production city and then send them to the AI with the most gold. If I go over here to my intelligence here, you can see that the spy tut in Toronto is stealing me 524 gold every four to six turns. That's a lot of gold. That's essentially at my current rate of gold income, an extra turn of gold income every four to six turns, depending on how quickly your spies complete missions. Not only that, but doing these siphon funds missions is actually a great way to level up your spies because your spies get a level up whenever they complete an offensive mission, like, for example, siphon funds. And siphon funds is one of the missions with the highest success rate. So if you just do three siphon funds missions on one of your spies, you can often end up with a level three spy, not only netting you error score, but potentially a spy who can go on to do other, maybe more strategically important tasks like stealing technology, disabling spaceports or flooding dams or whatever you decide that your spy should spend his time doing. But if you don't know what your spy should be doing, build them as soon as you can and always be stealing gold. The amount of gold I have stolen in this game alone is staggering and the amount of use I've gotten out of that gold is also staggering. I've purchased aircraft, for example, that I used to kill Greece. I've purchased buildings that were key. I've purchased builders when they were key to get strategic resources online. I've done a lot of really, really useful things with gold and that's why you should always be stealing gold. If you know what you're doing, you can use spies more effectively than stealing gold. But if you don't know what you're doing, just steal gold. That's been it. Those are my seven quick tips that people won't tell you about in Civ 6. I love you all very much, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.